talking about uh, four weeks in, uh, three weeks in at least, four weeks in on this MOVE series. And uh, we haven't, um, today, haven't welcomed our online folks. Um, we've got s- several people that watch us online. We're grateful to have you part of us. We want you to not just, uh, not just uh, watch us, but take part in what we do. So let us know where you're at or where you're from. And, and uh, we'd, we'd love to respond to you this morning. Let's just give them a round of applause this morning. And we're grateful for that. If you don't know who I am, I am Steve Longley. I get to be the pastor here, and uh, it is uh, an awesome opportunity and uh, love serving this group of people. And uh, I'm, I'm just seeing where I usually see filled in holes. There's a lot of folks gone today because this is the last weekend before school starts, and so last way to get a break in before school starts. We have a lot of folks traveling, so be praying for uh, those who are usually here but that are not today. And uh, um, we're grateful that you, that you stayed behind. And we're not bitter at all about those people being gone, are we? Yeah, no, we are not bitter at all in 103 degrees weather today. So anyway, uh, so we're in this series called Move. And it's about um, opportunities to move into what God is doing to, and uh, to grow in, in the way that God would have us grow in, in Part of that involves us doing something. It's not just that God does something in us, but he calls us to do something. And today, we're going to talk about uh, one move uh, that we'll see about picking up our gifting. We're going to look at Exodus chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. And I know that you've been sitting down for just a little bit, but I am going to have you stand for the reading of God's word, if you will. And let's receive God's word today. Uh, after a conversation already ongoing with God, uh, where Moses is being asked to lead God's people out of slavery, Moses answers God, what if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? Would people ever say things like that? I don't know. And the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? A staff. He replied, the Lord said, throw it on the ground. Well, Moses threw it on the ground and it worked. My, There we go. There we go. Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake. And I love this next line. And he ran from it. <laughs> then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. At which Moses said, ew. So Moses reached out and took hold of the snake and turned it back into a staff in his hand. And it turned back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. This is the word of the Lord. Yes, thanks be to God. All right, you may be seated. Well... Um, we're going to talk about gifting, so not, not a lot of uh, uh, slowly moving into this. We're just going to get right to it this morning. And uh, I'm going to tell you, give you just a couple of ideas. This is where I'm coming from with the idea of gifting. Maybe you've been in the church for years, so you've heard some of this before. And maybe you're brand new to this, so you need to hear this at this time. But we believe that, that once we become a Christian, uh, when we cross the threshold of faith... That God's spirit gets a hold of us, fills us uh, with new life from God, and gifts us in such a way that we, can, uh, that we participate in the church and that we build each other up. And so we believe this, that everybody is gifted in some way by the Holy Spirit. You are Gifted. I, I want you to look at the person next to you. Tap them on the shoulder and say, you're gifted. All right? Now, don't make it creepy or anything like that. But I just want, you, want them to know they're gifted. And uh, they may not know that this morning. They may think, yeah, right. Yeah, right. Um, when you look at certain people and you say, man, uh, you speak, you know, like three languages. And um, you know how to play several instruments. And uh, plus, you're a really strong leader, and you can sing really well and things like that. That's somebody who's gifted. We believe that everyone is 
gifted, everyone, because the Holy Spirit will fill all of us. The Holy Spirit binds us together as the family of God. Uh, we are saved and washed and called God's children, but the Holy Spirit helps make us the family of God, which is really, um, and, and we talked about it this morning, uh, just, just in the, during the Sunday school time, uh, really, which is counter to everything in our culture. Uh, when you look around this room, look around just real quick, just don't, don't make it real obvious, but look at some of the folks here, some of the folks here and go, you know what? I'm not sure I would be on a bowling league with that person, you know, <laughs> I and mean, we just don't have a lot of in common or anything like that. But when you become, when you become a new creation in Christ, you are part of a family that is a new family that is unlike any other family on the face of the earth. One where the least among us is as valuable as the sharpest among us. And it is an incredible family to be a part of and each and every one of us has been given a gift. Now, the next um, uh, Romans chapter 12 verses six through eight says this, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. Grace means gift. And so you could almost read this like we have different gifts according to the gift given to each of us. Well, God gives us those gifts. God is the one that decides who gets what gifts and, uh, and how they're used. And if your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. And if it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. The Apostle Paul is just letting us know that God has given us gifts and he's given them not for not just for our benefit, but for the benefit of the whole church. You know, um, we had three uh, beautiful ash trees in our yard and those stinking Japanese beetles got to them. Has anybody else experienced this? And, you know, it's, it's really sad because a beautiful tree, lush tree, full of beautiful leaves, all of a sudden, one year doesn't look quite right. And it kind of loses its leaves before all the other trees do at the end of the year. And then the next year, it looks like, you know, about a fourth of the leaves come out on it. And it just kind of suffers a little. And the tree is trying to live and trying to live and trying to live. But each one of those leaves is essential because each one of those leaves do what? Provide nourishment for the entire plant. The, the body of Christ is a lot like that. Each one of us provides nourishment in Christ for each other and is, is very important to the whole. In fact, there are gifts that you have that others need right now, some of them are barely hanging on and need your encouragement. Others have yet to, yet to walk across the threshold of faith, who have an opinion of the church that has been created by a culture that doesn't have a very high opinion of the church and they need to meet you. Because once meeting you, they'll know that the church is about grace and hospitality and love and, uh, and about following Christ with your whole heart. And they'll see in your authenticity the grace of Christ. You are needed. And your gifting is intended to build up the body of Christ. Now, in the world, it's a little different, isn't it? Your gifting in the world... And your abilities in the world, when we go to our world's culture, is intended to build up your bank account, right? Isn't, isn't that the way that it goes? I mean, uh, Wendell didn't go to years and years and years of school to not benefit from being a doctor, right? Uh, and and, uh, and uh, it, Darren, you didn't, you didn't learn how to fly and spend all kinds of time in, uh, in the military flying and that kind of thing to not benefit from that now, right? Say amen for cash, right? Okay. Uh, God, God provides for our needs. But in the world, we're out, uh, our culture is kind of out, each of us for ourselves. But the very different thing about this is that our gifts are intended to build up the body of Christ. You have benefited from the gifts of other people. 
from the teaching gifts, but also the hospitality gifts and also um, the, the service gifts of other people. Uh, also, the compassionate gifts of other people, the, the, the teaching gifts of other people, the musical gifts of other people. We have benefited from all of those other things and other people need to benefit from you. And then here's the third thing, and this is going to get into our text uh, a little bit here. Your gifting may not seem remarkable to you. How many of y'all look around and go, nah, I ain't gifted, but that person is. Anybody like that? Say amen if that's you this morning. And you just go, nobody needs my gift. Nobody needs my gift. I'm an accountant. Who needs that? You know, that kind of thing. I, I, I'm, uh, uh, I, I can, if your pipes leak in your bathroom, I can fix that. Who needs that gift other than somebody with plumbing problems, right? How many of us sometimes look at our gifting and go, why, why did the Lord give them all of that and it left me with this, Right? left us with something that we feel is kind of second rate. And I, that's why I want to get into this Exodus chapter just a little bit. Because when you look at Moses, God uses something in his life that wasn't much. In fact, I think God does this on purpose. And so let's, let's just look at the, the life of Moses just a little bit. Do you remember uh, how, how the story of Exodus starts where Moses was in the whole scheme of things. Pharaoh sends out an edict because he's frightened of how quickly the Israelites are growing to murder all the male babies of Israel, which is a shocking thing to us. But, but that's what kings did at that time. If you wanted to overcome another people and assimilate them uh, into your world or enslave them in your world, and if they had a chance of uprising, well, you could take care of that because you could take care of it at the start. And so they took care of the babies. Well, Moses' mom you know, wasn't too keen on that idea, and so she puts him in a basket and drops him in the Nile. And as the story goes, the Pharaoh's daughter picks him up, and Moses is raised in Pharaoh's household. So Moses, of all the Israelites, understands what Pharaoh is like, what his household is like, how their government runs, how people are taught, and that kind of thing. But it doesn't go well for Moses for very long. Because when he gets older, he sees, one, uh, he sees uh, uh, someone, um, uh, uh, an Egyptian, mistreating a, an Israelite. And in fact, the Israelite is being beaten and Moses lies in wait and murders the guy and then realizes, which after we've done something wrong, we all have a moment of realization, don't we? Oh, wow, I didn't think that through very well, did I? And then he has to run away and he runs and where he runs for the next 40 years of his life is to be a shepherd. Can you imagine that? Going from the comforts of Pharaoh's household to being a shepherd. How many of you are ranchers in here or know a little bit about ranching? Anybody? Anybody? Um, you know, Caleb Sandlin and his kids are not here. The girls know more about ranching than I ever will. And, you know, they're, what are they, 10, 11, or something like that? They know more about ranching than I ever will. So, Brian, a little bit of ranching in your life, right? Um, is it anything like staying in the Wyndham Beverly Hills Hotel? Is that what ranching is like? Huh? Not even, close. Not even close. It's dirty hard work, isn't it? It's a lot of fun at times, uh, but it's dirty hard work and you get kicked a lot. That's what I remember from it uh, when you're working the, the calves and things like that. Uh, it, sh being a shepherd is dirty hard work and in an in a area where there's not a lot of grass and that kind of thing. They have to travel a lot. It's hot. It's dusty. So I would think... Moses at times, though I love the outdoors and love uh, isolation at times, I believe there were times that he thought, you know, I had it pretty good in Pharaoh's household. But God calls him to become a leader and to lead his people out of slavery from the Egyptians and into the promised land. And Moses the whole time is trying to talk him out of it. That's where we pick up on this story. The whole time, Moses 
is trying to talk him out of it. And then in Exodus chapter 4 and verse 2, as Moses is trying to tell God, you're picking the wrong guy. I don't know. I can't do this. Uh, I'm not sure I can, I can, I'm the one that you should be, uh, be working with here. How do I even know that you're at work? And the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? And what does Moses say? A staff. What's a staff? A stick. That's right, a stick. <laughs> You're watching the wrong kind of... No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, anyway, uh, a stick. How many of you love going camping or something like that? And one of the things that you got to do as a kid, the things I always had to do is grab a stick that was a good walking stick because you know, as a kid, you need a walking stick, right? Uh, then you get a stick. And... And I remember as a 10-year-old boy in the mountains of Colorado thinking, you know what, this is so special. I'm going to keep this stick the rest of my life. And it is going to, my grandchildren one day, I will tell them about my stick. And you know what my parents did every time that I wanted to take that stick home? You know what they did? Threw it in the fire and said, we don't need another stick at our house. We've got trees at our house. We've got wood. You've got more junk in your room than you can handle. And so they wouldn't let me take it. Because sticks aren't very valuable, right? But what was this stick? What was his staff? His staff was a reminder of what God was calling him out of and what God was calling him into. God was calling him out of leading sheep and into leading his people. And God cho chooses to take the thing that Moses may have been a little bit embarrassed by. That Moses maybe wishes he could leave behind. That Moses thinks is not the most valuable part of his life. And he says, what do you have in your hand? And Moses says, a stick. That's all I got. It's a stick. But you know what? I think God chooses the stick because he can do a whole lot more with Moses than he can a stick. But God wants to show Moses first what his power can do with just a stick. Do you think the gift that God gave you might be worth just a little bit more than a stick? Anybody here a little bit more talented than a plank of wood, right? Right? <laughs> A little bit more available than maybe just an old piece of wood that you found out on a trail somewhere. When God chooses to use you, he can use whatever gift you have, no matter how valuable you think it is. And in comparison to other people, all the time you are going to go, what I've got is not much. What of God is not much, but God doesn't ask you how valuable your gift is. He says, what's in your hand? What do you got? What are you going to do with what you've got? And at some points in our life, we can go to God. You know, I've got a lot of bad decisions. I've got a lot of conflict. I've got a bad history. But God will find something in your life. And maybe it is something that reminds you of what you're not very proud of. But God may say, that is something that I can use. And I'm going to transform it. And I'm going to use it powerfully in my kingdom. And you know what? When, God, when Moses gave up the stick, God uses what is surrendered to him. God uses... What and who is surrendered to him? There is no difference between you and Moses. Think about it. When the stick turns to a snake, Moses runs from it. You'd be in good company with Moses, right? How many of y'all don't like snakes in this room, right? Just say amen with me. You're in good company with Moses, okay? 
Um, the only reason why I like snakes at all is because in Colorado, for the most part, where we lived, there were garter snakes, and they're pretty harmless, you know? Every now and then you'd find a rattler, but they're pretty easy to tell from gardener snakes. Now, out here, there are snakes that look a lot like garter snakes that might take you out, and so I try to not mess with snakes too much here in town. However, Moses, like you, was a person. And Moses, like you, is at that point thinking, what will you do with a shepherd? Which is an interesting thing. Because Moses is a shepherd. A little bit later, who else is a shepherd? Who else is a shepherd? What's his name? Because he becomes king of Israel. What's his name? David was a shepherd. And this imagery of the shepherd becomes very, very important to Israel. And Jesus talks a lot about being the shepherd of Israel. Jesus is the shepherd of God's sheep. God gives dignity to the things that we think, it ain't much. It ain't much. Um, the stick becomes something very important to the ministry of Moses. When you read through the book of Exodus, every high point at which God is at work powerfully among the people happens with that stick. God, God uses it, and he tells Moses when the Egyptian army is coming and they're bearing down uh, on, on the Egyptian army, he says to Moses, uh, because they're caught between that and the sea, he says, stretch out your staff. And then he parts the waters. Uh, there is another time when, uh, when the Israelites are very thirsty. And uh, they're without, uh, without water. And God tells him to strike the rock. And of course, there's another time when God tells him to do something else with a stick. And he strikes the rock. And God blesses them with water anyway. But, but God also condemns Moses for it. But every time God is at work through Moses with Israel, that stick becomes present and that thing that God that Moses surrendered to God is there when we read a little bit further into the story Moses finally packs up his people uh, but listen to how he packs up he says now the Lord had said to Moses and Midian go back to Egypt for all those who wanted to kill you are dead which if you want if people are looking to kill you it's a good thing not to go there for a while until maybe they're gone right so go back to Egypt where all those who wanted to kill you are dead. So Moses took his wife and his sons and put them on the donkey and started back to Egypt. And he took the staff of God in his hands. Whose staff is it now? And he took the staff of God. It's not Moses anymore. It's not Moses anymore. You know, once, once you begin to see God use your gifting... You begin to realize, and, and you go, Man, I just thought this was a weird talent that I had. And you begin to realize, this actually didn't belong to me. This is God's to use. This is God's to use. I am, uh, I am amazed at the people in our church and how they serve. I just am. I was talking with Carol Dye and uh, um, just... Just talking to her about, what all ministries have you done in our church? And she goes, about all of them. And uh, she was church board secretary. And uh, she, she was a Sunday school teacher. In fact, she was Noah Wiggler's Sunday school teacher for a while. Yeah. So blame her. <laughs> blame her, right? Actually, she said one of, the, one of the memories that she has is of teaching Noah. And she asked him to read a Bible verse. And he said, I don't know how to read. And uh, so she talked to his mom and dad, and his mom and dad said, he knows how to read. <laughs> he also knows how to not tell the truth. So you, got, you just got to push the right button there. And so look how Noah, don't look too close. Look, at, look how Noah turned out. I mean, I mean, come on. Aren't you grateful for Carol Dye teaching our kids and loving on our kids and using her gifts in ministry? Um, I... I I, I talk with some of the other folks, and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, one person that is just remarkable to me, um, Sonny, always said, I always felt bad because I didn't have gifts that I thought 
the church could use. Um, I don't think there is a thing in this building Sonny hasn't fixed, repaired, changed, upgraded, remodeled, or redesigned, right? Um, and, and I think Sonny gave his gift to God, and it wasn't his anymore. And God used it. I'm really proud of the way young folks are stepping up in our church and are serving. Um, uh, I, I think of uh, Laura and Lucas Jacobo. Uh, did, did you realize that Laura really didn't play the guitar until COVID? She learned how to play the guitar during COVID. What did you learn during COVID? I learned how to stay inside. <laughs> You know, I, I learned how to not to talk to other people and things like that. What did, what did you learn during COVID? She, she started playing the guitar. And, <laughs> and unfortunately, she lived with her dad at the time. And her dad goes, uh, hey, we, we might be able to use that. Right? <laughs> and, and then there's Lucas. And Lucas, did you realize Lucas never operated a soundboard before he came here? Did, did you realize that? He just made the mistake of asking Mike, hey, um, how can I help you? Um, Mike says, I love you and have a plan for your life. And so he taught him how to use the soundboard. You know what I am grateful for? I'm grateful for Laura and Lucas Jacobo and them using their gifts. <laughs> and then every Sunday I kind of look on the drum cage and I see my son Noah uh, playing in there. And I just go, I, crazy thing about it, he is shy uh, in front of other people. But one day he came and said that... Uh, I might be able to help with drums. You don't play drums. You play the trumpet. How hard can it be? <laughs> You're banging on things, right? He's, he's been part of marching band. He's seen the concussionists. He knows it is. <laughs> That's what we always called them. All right. I'm not sure what you called them. The concussionists. He picked up the drums. But here's the deal. God uses it. Um, his wonderful wife, Aisha, had a little solo part this morning. And uh, just in a weird father-in-law way, it brings tears to my eyes every time. I just think God uses her in that way. But she, she also said, Ben, you guys kind of need help in the nursery. Can I... Can I help in the nursery? If you ever ask, can I help in the nursery? The answer is yes. All right. And as, long, as long as you, you know, pass the background test, the answer is yes. But, but she, 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 I just feel like it'd be great to love on kids. I, I'm really, really proud of uh, Nicole uh, and Hannah and the way that they organize and love our children. I'm really proud as well of those of you who have been part of this church forever and ever who are still using your gifts in ministry. Mike High grew up in the church and I am so grateful for his leadership. He leads well. He organizes well. If you have a gift, which means you've invited Jesus into your life and the Holy Spirit's given you a gift... The church needs it. Not because we are a well-oiled humming machine. But because we are a family of Christ. That doesn't stand against the world. But we're very different than the world. In fact, we're for the world in the most positive of ways. But we're different enough from the world. That the way God would use our gifts here together for each other. Is very differently than we would use them in the world. And... And in fact, it is a symbol to the world that God is at work and that God is alive. Did you hear when Moses talks to, or when God talks to Moses and he says, I, I'm going I'm to show them that the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob is at work in their midst. And the way he's going to show them that Abraham, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob is at work in their midst is by using a stick. God wants to use your gift 
to build up his church to show the world that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is at work in our world today, a world that has worked hard to look the other way from God. I am uh, I'm having to read a lot of, uh, go back and reread a lot of philosophers for a project that I'm working on. If you want happiness in your life, do not read French and German philosophers. Um, and every single one of them, uh, when you not only read what they've written, but, but read about their life's work, um, you realize um, that on, in their writings, they say they're very compassionate and loving towards humanity, but they don't like people very much. Uh, they just don't. They can't stand people. And so I've uh, been, been reading uh, a lot of that stuff and uh, um, also reading their view of humanity. It's a really low view of humanity. When I read the Gospels, when I read Scripture, you know what? God has a very high view of his creation called humanity. God believes that you are important to what he is doing in this world. Our culture more and more is believing in the ideas of French and German philosophers, buying in to their nihilism, buying into their dim view of the world, buying in uh, to their fragmented ideas of culture, where, where this part of culture needs to be against that part of culture, and that part of culture needs to be against that part of culture. And in the body of Christ, we believe that we are a single humanity that is created and fractured by, but fractured by sin, but created in such a way that once Jesus Christ comes into our lives, we're, we're brought back together in a united family in a way that, that the world doesn't understand. That the world looks at and goes, no, that shouldn't, be, that shouldn't be right at all. That shouldn't be possible. I want you to know redemption is a beautiful, incredible thing. And it gifts us and we become part of the redemptive plan. So both the person using their gifts and the church are transformed by the surrender of our gifts to God. You're transformed by using your gift to God. Because you know what? When you begin using your gift to God and you begin going, this useless thing, you want to use this? I, I, I imagine Moses would have said, you know, you can find a stick like this anywhere. If you want to buy this one from me, you can buy it from me. That'd be great. I'll find another one somewhere for free. But he gives it to God. And I imagine at the end, at some point in Moses' life, Moses, somebody said, hey, did you sell that thing for me? I bet Moses said, it ain't for sale. <laughs> because it's not mine. It's not mine. So I guess the big question this morning is this. Do you have a very high view of you? Because God does. Not a high view of you just going off on your own and doing your own thing. But a high view of you surrendered to Him. He, he loves you as His children. He, he can use that. But He's also given you something. He's giving it to you. I don't know what it is. Maybe you're good at organizing. Maybe you're good at talking. Uh, remind me of the young man's name that was up here. I, Xander. Wow. Yeah. Did he put like hours of preparation into that? I, I mean, I saw him looking at the card and the whole thing. <laughs> I won't, you know, I won't bug him about that. But does he like prepare for everything that he does? Yeah. That's a gift. Um. You know what? God's going to use that as long as he surrenders. You know what? The world's going to use that too if he surrenders it to the world. But God will use that gift for the benefit of the world. The world will use that gift until it's been sucked dry. Um, so what will you do with the gift that you've been given? So, let's just say, 
Um, someone gave me a gift. I, I like getting gifts. Uh, do you like getting gifts? Gifts are great, aren't they? They're just incredible. And somebody just gave me a gift. And, you know, I didn't open it right then because it was in the hallway. It was in front of you. And I didn't want to embarrass you. And I didn't want you to go, wait, I didn't get a gift, you know, and that kind of thing. And so, so I just didn't open it right then. I just told them, I'll open it later. It's a little awkward right now. And they'd say, okay, okay, okay. But then I don't say about it for a month. Let's just say you are the one that gave me a gift. I'm not telling you to give me the gift. However, no, I'm just kidding. Let, let's just say you haven't heard from me for a while about the gift. You don't, you don't know if I gave you the gift. So you come to me like a month later. Just go, by the way, how'd you like that gift? And my answer to you is this. Let's just be honest. I, I didn't open it. Yeah, it's kind of in the back seat of my car with the other ones. That would make you feel like giving me more gifts, wouldn't it? There's a guy that appreciates a good gift. There's a guy that needs a gift. You might say, you going to open that? Because I put some thought into that. And it's, it's not really... That the gift is a huge gift, but it, the gift is a symbol of my love for you, my, my appreciation for you, a symbol of the fact that I care for you. And you threw it in the back seat. You understand what I'm getting at? God's given you a gift. You can open that. God's gift to you is an expression of his love for you. God's gift to Moses is an expression of God's love for his people, but also a love for Moses. You realize that? Moses didn't understand the honor that he was being given that day. Moses didn't have a clue what that meant. He's just scared of Pharaoh. There's things when we get gifts we're scared of, right? I'm scared of being up front. I'm scared of being behind the scenes. I am scared of responsibility. I'm scared I might have to show up early. I'm scared I might have to stay a little bit late. I'm scared other people may have expectations of me. But here's the deal. God's gifting to you is because he loves you. And he loves his people. And Moses, as he unravels this gift, it becomes a way bigger gift than he thought. You can open that gift. You can use what God's given you. Oh, worship team, would you come? I leave it to you. I want you to respond as the Spirit gives you ability to respond, as the Spirit calls you to respond. Perhaps you're sitting here thinking, I, I need a gifts test. No, you don't. You probably already know what God has given you. If you need someone to help you discover it, Mike High is a great person to talk to. <laughs> Let's bow our heads for a moment. Heavenly Father, um, I thank you for gifting people in my life with leadership abilities. Uh, who tenderly, lovingly, and with purpose led in such a way that I might hear your call in the ministry. I'm grateful for a little old lady who was my second grade Sunday school teacher was the first older person outside of my family who showed anything like compassion for a squirrely, energetic kid with a mind of his own. I thank you that Myrtle Appleby opened her gift and used it. Lord, my life is different because other people surrendered what you'd given to them and said, Lord, use it however you would use it. And this morning, I just pray that, that joy from my friends here today. That as part of God's church, 
as part of those who don't stand against our culture. We stand for it in the best possible way. Because we have a love for the people of our world. We have a love for them. We want them to know Jesus. So Lord, would you use our gifts in a way today, in the body of Christ, in a way that says there is a way, a truth, and a life. There is hope for tomorrow. There is hope in this world. There is forgiveness in this world. And there is peace in this world. And it's found in Jesus Christ. Lord, would you use us in that way? Give us the strength to open the gift that you've given us and to use it. For Lord, it is yours in the first place. We're grateful. Grateful today in Jesus' precious name. Amen. As a gift to God, let's stand and let's sing together and close out our worship today.